Welcome to the History of North America. I'm Mark Vinette. The Columbian Exchange was the widespread transfer of human populations, plants, animals, precious metals, commodities, culture, technology, diseases, religion, and ideas between North America in the Western Hemisphere and the Afro-Eurasian Old World in the Eastern Hemisphere. It is named after the Italian explorer Christopher Columbus and is related to the European colonization and global trade following his 1492 voyage. Some of the exchanges were purposeful, some were accidental or unintended. Jack Henneman of the History of the Americans podcast has kindly agreed to share his interpretation on the Columbian Exchange. In 1492, the entire human population of the planet was in the vicinity of 450 to 600 million people, the gap perhaps explained in part by the controversy over the pre-Columbian population of the Western Hemisphere. We do know that by 1500, the population of Europe had not grown on a net basis since 1300. There was plenty of hunger in most places outside of the Western Hemisphere, and every reason to believe that humans in the Eastern Hemisphere had reached something of a limit in their capacity to grow or capture calories faster than their need to consume them. One can find a graph of estimated human population from 10,000 BC to the projected population in 2100. From common era year zero to 1500, the world's population grew from 188.24 million people to 461.37 million people. That is a compound annual growth rate of just under six hundredths of a percent By contrast, from 1500 to 1800, the period after Columbus but before the confounding influences of the Industrial Revolution, mechanization of food production, and big improvements in public health, the world population grew from that 461.37 million people in 1500 to 989.82 million, or a compound annual growth rate of 0.25%. That is obviously more than quadruple the rate that prevailed during the entire run from the birth of Christ to 1500. And of course, the quadruple growth rate is in spite of a catastrophic early setback, the demographic disaster in the Western Hemisphere after old world diseases killed off at least 80% of the native population. 1492 was, it turns out, an inflection point, the first curve in the hockey stick of human population growth. The location of population also changed radically. In 1492, the world's biggest cities clustered in the tropics, all but one within 30 degrees of the equator. They were Beijing, Vijayanagar in southern India, Cairo, Hangzhou, and Nanjing in China, Tabriz in Iran, Gaur in India, Tenochtitlan, capital of the Aztec Empire, Istanbul, and perhaps Gao in the Songhai Empire in West Africa, and Cusco, capital of the Inca Empire. By 1900, every city in the top 10 will be in Europe and the United States, except Tokyo, which Charles Mann called the most westernized of eastern cities. Those changes all derive from the interhemispheric transmission of diseases, food crops, populations, cultures, and technologies in the years after Columbus's famous first voyage. That transmission is now known as the Columbian Exchange, a term invented in 1972 by the famous biological historian Alfred W. Crosby Jr. of the University of Texas at Austin. Here's how Charles Mann summarized it in the introduction to his book, 1493. Babies born on the day the Admiral founded La Isabella, January 2nd, 1494, came into a world in which direct trade and communication between Western Europe and East Asia were largely blocked by the Islamic nations between and their partners in Venice and Genoa. Sub-Saharan Africa had little contact with Europe and next to none with South and East Asia. And the Eastern and Western hemispheres were almost entirely ignorant of each other's very existence. By the time those babies had grandchildren, slaves from Africa mined silver in the Americas for sale to China. Spanish merchants waited impatiently for the latest shipments of Asian silk and porcelain from Mexico, 
and Dutch sailors traded cowrie shells from the Maldive Islands in the Indian Ocean for human beings in Angola on the coast of the Atlantic. Tobacco from the Caribbean ensorcelled the wealthy and powerful in Madrid, Madras, Mecca, and Manila. Group smoke-ins by violent young men in Tokyo would soon lead to the formation of two rival gangs, the Bramble Club and the Leather Breeches Club. The Shogun jailed 70 of their members and then banned smoking. Columbus's signal accomplishment, in the words of Alfred W. Crosby, was to re-knit the seams of Pangaea, close quote. The most immediately consequential outputs of the Columbian Exchange were diseases, primarily from the old world to the immunologically defenseless populations of the new. Before the invasion of peoples of the new world by pathogens that evolved among inhabitants of the old, Native Americans lived in a relatively disease-free environment. Before Europeans initiated the cultural exchange of germs and viruses, the peoples of the Americas suffered no smallpox, no measles, no chickenpox, no influenza, no typhus, no typhoid or parathyroid fever, no diphtheria, no cholera, no bubonic plague, no scarlet fever, no whooping cough, and no malaria. Disease-free certainly overstates it, relatively being a very important word. There were plenty of native pathogens. It's just that few of them were comprehensively lethal the way the old world bugs were. The Western Hemisphere was still by comparison a veritable paradise on Earth, in the strictest sense, the most up-to-date negative consequence of the Columbian Exchange. Regardless, we know from the earliest stories of encounters between Europeans and Indians from Columbus to Verrazano and others that the Indians were just very attractive, or at least seemed so to the Europeans. Disease takes a toll and often leaves visible physical damage, such as the pox part of smallpox. So in addition to being well-fed and naked, the Indians probably looked so good because they were so very rarely sick. Anyway, when these diseases washed ashore in Europeans and Africans and the animals they brought, they killed between 80 and 95% of the Indian population within the first 150 years. The regions least affected lost 80% of their populations. Those most affected lost their full populations. And a typical society lost 90% of its population. There are several things that might be said about the horrific impact of Eastern Hemisphere diseases on the Indians of the Western Hemisphere. First, the rolling pandemic so emptied the land and weakened Indian society and culture that the second wave of European settlers, after the first explorers, developed the mistaken impression that there had never been very many Indians and that they were primitive and poor naturally. In other cases, even the first explorers to reach a tribe got there too late to see the true culture. Disease had raced ahead of them, having been transmitted down a chain by Indians who had encountered Europeans. Second, the Europeans did not at that stage want the Indians to die. This was not because 16th century Spanish settlers were great humanitarians or cared deeply about the Indians per se. With a couple of famous exceptions, they did not. The Spanish wanted Indians to live so that they could convert them and, well, enslave them. There was a lot of gold and silver to be mined and eventually a lot of sugar and tobacco to be farmed. The seeming fragility of the Indians was frustrating for the Spanish project in the Americas, at least in its first century. And the collapse of the Indian population would quickly lead to the expensive and dangerous importation of slaves from Africa. The same thing would happen in the British tidewater colonies of North America 150 years later. Indians would die off from disease or not otherwise pan out as slaves, so Europeans would slowly turn to African slaves. Third, and this is the tough bit to swallow, Indian civilizations were doomed whether it was Christopher Columbus, or the Spanish, or the Portuguese, or some other peoples who would inevitably connect the hemispheres. But then their pre-Columbian civilizations were, by and large, destined to die. Eventually, some expedition from the Eastern Hemisphere would have found the Western Hemisphere, spewed its viruses and bacteria all over the place, and then somewhere between 80 and 95% of the Indians would have died. It might have been the Chinese if they had renewed blue ocean exploration, or the Russians crossing to the Pacific Northwest, or the English, or the Swedes, or the Dutch, or the Arabs. No matter who it was, no matter when it was, the Indians would have died en masse, and the discoverer would not have known why. 
There are therefore many grounds in which to condemn Columbus and the Spanish who followed him, but destruction of the original Indian civilizations was pretty much hardwired. Now, lest you arise as one and accuse me of being a Eurocentric apologist for the intentional abuse and exploitation of the Indians who survived the pandemics, rest assured that no such defense is intended. You might be wondering why diseases did not flow from the new world to the old. Well, the most likely explanation is that the earliest settlers across the Bering Land Bridge seemed to have done away with the large mammals in the Western Hemisphere, which did not evolve with large primates and were unprepared to encounter Homo sapien. The Indians, therefore, did not have large animals to domesticate and invite into their homes, which meant they created far fewer opportunities for ugly diseases to jump from animals to humans. They fundamentally lived in a disease light environment until that day on Watlings Island, except for one disease. For ages, scholars argued over whether syphilis came from the New World. Syphilis was thought to have first appeared in Europe in the years after Columbus, brought by his crew. Remember when the Indians of Hispaniola fetted his crew and, quote, satisfied their other wants? We are a family podcast, so we will let the implication dangle there. But the historical claim was that some of Columbus's men joined the military campaign of Charles VIII of France against the Kingdom of Naples in 1495. There, they sported with the local professional ladies, who spread it around the French army. When the exposed mercenaries went on other missions, the disease spread very quickly, reaching Hungary and Russia by 1497, Africa, the Middle East, and even India by 1498, China by 1505, and Japan by 1569. The French even took the blame for this, since syphilis was known for years, by many people, as the French disease. There was a competing theory that syphilis had always existed in the Old World, but had been locked up in some reservoir. The Old World theory of syphilis persisted for two reasons. First, modern researchers found it hard to believe that a few men from Nina and Pinta could have spread the disease so widely and so quickly. Perhaps those researchers lacked imagination. Second, there were a few European skeletons from before Columbus that showed some of the same scarring that syphilis causes in bones. Modern science is mostly disposed of the old world explanations and places the origin of syphilis fairly definitively in the Western Hemisphere. When it first hit Europe, syphilis was a very nasty disease. It was frequently fatal, and if it didn't kill you, it caused genital ulcers, severe rashes and pain, big old tumors, and dementia. The wider syphilis spread, the more opportunity it had to mutate, and it eventually became more benign and less fatal. The transfer of foods from one hemisphere to the other as part of the Columbian Exchange had tremendous impact on populations. Next time, we examine how the exchange transformed the global supply of food. I'm Mark Vinette, and I hope you're enjoying the ride.